hello to all the 85 people who are now watching, apparently. Um, I'm very flattered and pleased to be here um, talking to you. Um, I've been uh, volunteering with the Water Recovery Group for some 11 years now. And the, the uh, occasion that inspired me to get involved with the Water Recovery Group was discovery on the Grand Western Canal uh, near Wellington uh, of a boat lift that had been restored by the Water Recovery Group. And I got very excited and I joined in and um, what you're going to see uh, now it is the result uh, 11 years later of my interest in what's been going on. Um, I'm going to start straight away into my presentation because um, I'm going to begin by thanking people. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about isn't just my own work, it's the work of uh, about a hundred different people. You're going to see them in order of uh, their involvement over the years since 2017. These are all volunteers and the um, important thing to realize about this is all these people, amongst all these people, only two people had ever done archaeology before. So uh, the normal canal camp runs for uh, less than a week, five, five or six days. Um, there's always a day of wet weather when nothing happens very much other than us avoiding the rain, uh, because this is, usually uh, happens in British summers. And these camps have, uh, have been taken place in Wales, which of course is west and slightly wetter. Um, and these uh, volunteers, of all ages from 18 to 80 have had to uh, learn how to do archaeology in a very very short time. Archaeology is quite a demanding uh, discipline because you only get one chance at things. If we were to dig something and destroy it and not record it you can't go back again and dig it again. It's gone and so uh, the training aspect of this and the discipline part of this is really important. And these people, that, uh, what, what I'm going to be talking about basically happened in six weeks, uh, spread across three summers. And it's an amazing achievement by those volunteers, those nearly 100 people, to learn archaeology, to take part in archaeology, and to uh, achieve something really tangible in such a short time. I ought to also thank not only the Waterway Recovery Group for supporting this and the IWA, but also the local trust, the Monmouth Brecon and Abergavenny Canals Trust, who all um, uh, supported what we were doing. Now, canal archeology, span considering we've got over 2,700 miles of navigable canals and another 700 miles of abandoned canals, there actually hasn't been all that much uh, practical, physical, uh, canal archaeology. It's mostly uh, focused on the standing buildings and the, uh, the restoration of the canals themselves and the, and the locks and the rebuilding of the locks and the maintenance of the locks and all that. Um, a couple of uh, these, are, this is on the, uh, 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 the remains of a, of a boat visible there uh, and uh, on the Cromford Canal a little tunnel here, just down the road. One of the things that's happening at the moment, of course, is social distance exercise. And I exercise in a local bird reserve called St. Aidan's. And this is a, a, a route of a canal that went through uh, that uh, bird reserve. And this is more typical, I suppose, of what people might think canal archeology span would be. It's the excavation of a boat on the Stover Canal, one of several uh, boats that were uh, excavated. There's another one. Um, archaeologically speaking, this is very interesting because it's a boat-shaped hole, which uh, boat-shaped trench, which um, isn't normal practice. I have to say, um, the right, the left-hand edge of this um, slot slot is slightly more. Uh, and here we are uh, excavating uh, the granite tramway, granite track of a tramway again at Ventiford uh, Basin on the Stover Canal. Um, but 
all these miles and miles of canal, the whole canal network, every single centimetre of canal is an archaeological site. There are at least, you know, they, 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 we've got a couple of recent openings, but most canals are more than 100 years old, if not 200 or more. And every centimetre is an archaeological um, site. And it's worth remembering that uh, as you walk along the towpath or as you take part in a, um, a restoration project uh, or you sail along in a boat, you are in the midst of an archaeological site. And that, um, to me, uh, suggests that we should be looking at the canals not only as a source of leisure and of pleasure, but also of a source of uh, knowledge about our past and also about the people who were associated with the canals. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, what I'm going to be uh, treating as an example of canal archaeology, because obviously it involves me, um, took place on the Monmouthshire Brecon and Abergavenny Canal, just north of Newport, just west of, um, of Cumbran in Monmouthshire. Uh, and at a place called Tichoch. Um, and at Tichoch, there's a flight of locks. Starts at top lock at the top there, north, cabin lock, Rachel's lock, break lock, shop lock, lower break lock, bottom lock, Tredegar lock, and Draper's lock. And I know all of them very well, apart from cabin lock and top lock, which haven't yet been um, looked at restoration wide. But the other locks have been part of a project called Waterworks. And um, since about 2014, when we moved to Draper's Lock, uh, we've been working on this stretch of Waterway Recovery Group, providing at least two camps a year, um, two camps worth of volunteers. Um, the, I have no idea why Break Lock is called Break Lock. Uh, Shop Lock uh, is called Shop Lock because, as you'll see in a minute, there was a... Um, uh, a workshop there. Now, this is uh, below shop lock, um, as, as it was about five years ago. Uh, uh, as usual, a damp mess, like many um, canal restoration sites. It now looks a bit more like this. And to achieve that, uh, involves quite a lot of work. And here's some of my volunteers from 2015, I think, um, repointing the uh, walls of that pound um, below the lock. And here we are shifting the, the muck, the stone, the rubbish, the silt, and um, whatever from the uh, pound itself. And it involves quite a lot of heavy work and quite a lot of ground disturbance. And during those years, um, I used to wander up and down the site. Um, and again, with my eyes on the ground as an archeologist, and I kept on picking up and noticing and picking up bits of pottery. The most common, of course, being blue and white, but also some quite spectacular other types of pottery. And it seemed to me that there was more of this type of this, this stuff than there should have been. Tikhoch isn't actually next door to anybody. There's a, there's a hamlet about a kilometre up the canal. Uh, there's a, what used to be a um, cider mill a bit about half a kilometre down. But there's no one, there's, there's nothing around Tikhoch itself to explain why there should be uh, such a, a large amount of material scattered about. So this is an old order survey map, end of uh, the uh, 1800s. And it shows in the middle there, if you can see my cursor, this is the workshop. The workshop was there beside shop lot, which is here. Uh, and we assume that it was used for building and maintaining lock gates. It was quite an um, accessible type of structure. Now, the rubbish that I was finding was, was as, as I wandered up and down these locks would have been mostly in here, the rubbish spread. Uh, and then uh, on the map as well, there's this little building here, which um, we assumed to be a cottage in which uh, the lock keeper lived, the lock keeper's cottage. So I persuaded the um, 
WRG, the Waterway um, Recovery Group and the local trust that it might be an idea if we learnt a bit more about this cottage. It's on the maps. Uh, no one seemed to have very much of a memory of it. It, it vanished it, it, about 50, 60, 70 years ago and no one seemed to know anything about it. So, so there's the uh, satellite image of the site as it was before we began. So you can see that the uh, 19th century workshop at the top here. It had in the middle a saw pit, which was excavated in 2014. This is the local trusts um, building in which they build lock gates. There's shop lock, there's the canal coming down here. There's a pound there, the one you saw filled with water after we restored it. Uh, I say we, of course, um, I was there for you know two weeks every summer. I still claim it as mine. Um, a lot of the work was also done by a team, a local team of volunteers and um, the water work scheme, which employed people. Lower break lock. Um, all we knew about the cottage was from two sources. One was this painting, which shows the cottage here. Um, looks as if it's two story, it's got a, what I call a cat slide roof, goes right the way down, it's roofed in slate, which is important. Notice the colour of that roof, which looks as if it might be, that's the workshop, tiled in tile, perhaps. Um, so uh, two chimneys, one, one at either end. And this very bad photograph, uh, which is being reduced, uh, re reproduced from a, some a newspaper article, as you can see from the screening. Again, two stories, uh, four windows at the front, two chimneys, roof looks, looks vaguely as if it's slate. You can't see the back there because it's covered by the thing. So that's all we knew about it. We'd ask people, people would come along and say, oh yeah, I remember this, the lock keeper's cottage. Um, and then we'd ask them for information and they wouldn't have any. So this is what it was like before we started looking. Um, it was, uh, a, a sort of hard standing uh, where they mess around with the restoration materials. Not very inviting. The first year we had to find the cottage. So I dug a, a long narrow trench right the way across the, that area you've just seen in the hope that we'd find something. Uh, there's no guarantee, but the hope that we might find something was tell us where the cottage was. And lo and behold, this is the day that Anne-Marie found the very first traces of wall. I mean, you can see in the bottom of the trench there, uh, not very hugely deeply, thank goodness, but there is a wall. And we went on, uh, the weather that year wasn't wonderful, as you can see, uh, and, but the volunteers gamely hacking away at what was sort of quite nasty, uh, rubbly uh, ground to expose uh, what was behind. And here we are. Um, moving westwards across and you can see we've got walls, we've got floors, we've got all kinds of exciting things happening in the, in the end of the first year. So the end of the first year I said I wanted a second look and in the second year we moved back in, uh, here they are doing a quick bit of, uh, of, of housekeeping and uh, working again extending the trench uh, southwards so we can expose more of what was there. And at the end of the second year, we'd exposed this. I'm looking northwards across the whole site, uh, and um, I can explain what was going on uh, in, in more detail when we get to the, uh, the end. And then the third year, last year, we uh, again, uh, I, I persuaded everybody we wanted a final season there, um, and um, we uh, found, uh, I'm going to tell you more about that object in a minute, we found uh, a nice fireplace and we found lots of stuff. And this is the um, fascinating, one of the fascinating things about this area is it is crammed full of rubbish, a 19th and early 20th century rubbish. Uh, and it, it seems um, a slightly odd mixture because um, it, 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 it looks as if it's more rubbish than one household could produce, even if they were living there for a hundred years or so. And the dates are mixed and the, um, the contents are mixed. And as you can see from this slide, it, it, we had material working backwards from the very recent past. We've got a baby's shoe here and a, and a baby's dummy. Uh, we've got a file here um, and 
uh, lots of, but we've also gotten some nice early uh, earlier material here. Um, and so we went on. Now I love this stuff. This is transfer printed um, 19th century, early 20th century material in found in abundance on this site and um, f huge variation in designs in um, uh, we've uh, we found you'll see in a minute we found more of this particular material and of course they were heavy smokers uh, clay pipes dozens of bits of clay pipe including some quite spectacular ones one with a face on here um, local clay pipe makers from Cardiff here uh, one from Ireland here um, and whatever so nice mixture of clay pipe. Clay pipes are nice because they're useful for for dating the, the site. Uh, an early early-ish clay pipe, uh, a latest a latish uh, clay pipe there. Now uh, my research interests. Uh, one of the things that I uh, really am obsessed by uh, is miniaturization, and uh, one of the uh, satisfying things about the the work we've been doing has been that we have actually found miniature things, tiny um, vessels. And this is a selection of uh, some of them we found. We probably found about a dozen pieces in all, little jug, little cup, two little plates. Um, and to go back to that object that crept in there, the, the thrill of uh, last year, the, the climax in material culture ways uh, was the discovery of this uh, little um, figurine. As you can see, it's only about, it would have been only about seven centimeters long when it was complete, uh, made out of bisque, glazed bisque porcelain. And these little figurines uh, fascinate me because they are found around the world. You'll find these in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, uh, North America, Canada, South America, um, India, whatever, uh, and across Europe, of course. And in, in America, they're called frozen charlottes, which is a name which they didn't have originally. It was applied in the middle, late 20th century, but um, they were obviously made in very large numbers. And I always had a hope that we'd find one at Tichoch, and we did. Uh, so, and I'll uh, talk a bit more about those um, at, the, at the end just to keep you uh, tantalized. And here, two, actually two strange finds on this page. This is um, uh, on, the, on my right hand end, I hope it's your right hand end too, is a gas fitting from a boiler or something like that. Well, this building, the, the cottage and the workshop, neither of them had electricity or gas or running water. So uh, it's a bit odd finding a gas fitting. We also found several electric uh, fittings, switches and things. And then of course, in the middle here is a fake beard. Um, and again, you wonder what on earth a fake beard is doing miles from anywhere by a canal in an area where you wouldn't expect fake beards to occur. And if any of my volunteers are watching, they will know that I am obsessed by, obsessed by bricks as well as miniatures bricks. And here is a selection of bricks from the site um, and they uh, include the most significant one is a Henlis uh, brick. Henlis was literally just a kilometer up the canal. Um, so these are local bricks uh, that came and then we've got bricks from Newport uh, we've got Star Brick which is a very was a very pr uh, productive um, Newport and Eric Cumbran brick maker. Uh, and these bricks, obviously all of them can, uh, we can apply an approximate date to when they were made because the, 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 a lot of the companies were in existence for quite short times. Here, just another selection of fantastic uh, um, transfer printed pots. Uh, here is another one of this Chinese design. And um, we found another uh, example of this same where uh, this in, in 2019. Frustrating things like this, where you get a building here and all we get of the description is the first two letters. And I have searched Google umpteen times. 
to try and find what that building might have been, but I haven't had any luck yet. It's the sort of thing you do at uh, one o'clock in the in the depths of the night, uh, um, searching through um, hundreds of bits of pieces of, of uh, transfer printed pottery, see if you can find out where it was. It'll happen one day. This is archaeology. We have to record everything. Uh, we drew and measured every stone and every brick. And uh, here is one of the two other people who had actually done archaeology. Um, uh, working away and planning some of the things. Now at the end, the, the local trust decided that they wanted to um, not to fill the site in. Normally we would have filled the site in and it would re return to, it would, it would become invisible. But they decided they wanted to be visible and they wanted to, to be eventually a visitor attraction. So we had to make it safe. And that involved uh, shifting uh, quite a lot of gravel, uh, laying down a, a, a textile membrane and um, putting this gravel over the top and also consolidating the walls because the walls were made of a quite soft uh, mortar, lime mortar. We used a, a lime mortar to consolidate the walls, to strengthen them. Uh, and we used a mortar that was quite radically different color to the original which means that someone can come along in future years and say, oh yes, well, what we want to do is actually remove or record what was done in 2019 and get back to the original. And it will be a, a reasonably easy process to do. Um, and this is a view across the, the uh, building as it was as we left. So what have we got? We've got a building. Quite a small building which perhaps only had a single room on the ground floor. This is the ground floor plan. The, the southern wall unfortunately had been removed by a, a large hole that was dug in it presumably between the 1950s and the 1970s which is 1970s is when the local trust really moved in. And so we've lost the south wall, which would have been the wall with the doorway in it, which is sad, but uh, it, they left enough of the room for us to see what was going on. Here, we've got that fireplace, the one with the red tiles in front of it. You're looking in plan view, remember? And probably the um, fireplace had a little range in it. A nice little alcove in the wall. This wall is much thicker than all the other walls to, to allow the, fire, the fireplace to be there and an alcove um, and then the wall at, at these straight lines here were where the wall was um, covered with a layer of concrete or cement lime cement so there's one room and then a, a doorway with a doorstep going up into another room now it looks suspiciously like to me as if that's about a butt joint which means that this room may have been built after this, this one. And if you remember the um, uh, painting had a cat slide roof, the cat slide roof pop might have continued the roof line from this building down over this, um, what we call the scullery. And you, this, wall, this, back, this wall at the front is built really nicely, ashlar blocks of stone which may have been um, quarried from a, a nearby uh, ruined um, monastery. Uh, but the back of it is all rough. And that's because it was actually built into the slope of the ground. It's below ground level. Uh, and um, one of the bits of dating evidence we had was in the construction trench here that, that we found tiles that or the stamp Seely's patent. Seely didn't patent his tiles until 1845. So for those tiles to be in the construction trench meant that this, the earliest it could possibly have been built was 1845. And it's very unlikely to be built in the same year as the tiles were uh, patented. So, um, and remember they're red tiles as well. So they may have come from uh, another building nearby, which was demolished at some point before this was built. So in this room, this, the reason we call it the scullery was there was another fireplace here. 
And then in this corner, there was um, what we call the copper, a little um, fireplace here. And there probably would have been, I'll show you a picture of one soon, uh, a copper on top of this, a copper boiler where you heated up the water. Remember, there's no running water, no, all the heating was by um, using coal or whatever. In this corner, there's another brick stru um, structure, which I think, and there's no evidence for this, but I'm guessing may have had a sink on top. Um, and so the scullery they would have uh, used for their washing. Doorway here, another doorstep down into the passage here on the, on the west side. Bricks, brick floor here, brick floor missing here, nice um, fire clay tiles and bricks and things carrying the passage down. Another wall which was built into the ground, just had a very non-existent back edge really. Another little puzzle, a drain here with, with um, holes in the top to allow water through obviously. It connected presumably with these pipes, this glazed pipe that was put in after the rest of the passage was done. The, the, the fill of this trench was different. Um, if it, it, it presumably must have been taking water from the gutter because um, there's, there's no running water. They didn't have a shower or anything in that corner. So uh, we know uh, it, it, that the last people who lived in this building uh, were the lock keeper uh, and his two daughters. So it's a bit of a squeeze um, in this um, uh, little building. On the east side, there was a surface of, brick, of cement laid over bricks. Just here is the bywash of the canal. There's the east wall. And here, huge flagstones. Um, come back to them. And on the west side, leading out and down from that passage, but obscure width, was a uh, garden path. Again, using great big blocks of, of stone. So if you remember, this is what it looked like before. And this is what it looked like after. I think this is for, for given that we only had sort of 30 odd days uh, in all, in total, uh, those volunteers did a tremendous job. So there's the room, the main room of the house. There's the doorstep up into the scullery. There's the scullery. There's the copper. Uh, there's the doorway into the passage. And here's the passage going down the, the, the side here. Um, I'm going to stop that chair and Rafe, that was absolutely um, amazing. Are you going to um bring up any any other graphics at this point or yes, I'm going to see if I can get a, a picture of uh, I don't want it to do that I'm just uh, opening a separate set of files right. because there's a couple of little let me get rid of that mm -hmm. Okay, somewhere. While, while you're looking for those, I've certainly found it fascinating so far, and I know that we've got lots of questions coming in <laughs> on the Q&A, uh, and so uh, I'd encourage you to bring some more questions up there, but uh, back to Rafe again. Okay, this is the close-up of what we call the copper. So if you see it's on a little brick wall here, and an entrance here, it's, it's floor with brick and a support here. And if I can then go to uh, I'm assuming you can see this. This is what a copper looked like uh, being demolished. Same sort of structure, brick, little brick walls, fireplace underneath and a copper boiler in, in in, on top of it. So um, I think I'm quite confident in calling that a, uh, a, a, a copper of some sort. And now I'm going to open up 
Good. Uh, and this is just to scratch my head. This is the garden path. Um, and this is a this is a half meter um, scale. So these were huge chunks of stone that when it was before it broke is obviously broken in time. There was it may have been broken uh, much more recently by all the heavy machinery that was going over the top of it in this part of the, uh, the restoration. But um, uh, these are great big chunks. So where was where was the lock keeper getting these great big chunks of stone from? And why was he using such vast lumps of stone in his gar on his garden path um, that uh, went around the, the building? Uh, one of the uh, interesting little puzzles. Um, and just uh, another couple of great big slabs on the south uh, east corner, huge. I mean, they're, they're impossible for one person to lift. There's the cement and brick floor on the outside. My, my hope for this corner, and again, my, if any of my volunteers are watching, they will remember that I kept on going about the privy and how I wanted to find the privy because privies were one of the best places for, to find things. Uh, well, we never did find a definitive privy, I think because the people just um, used the, the nearby um, uh, by wash as their flushing uh, lavatory. But um, that, that, that could be something for um, future archaeologists to talk about. And finally, my last... Uh, actually, Rafe, sorry to interrupt at this uh, point. Can I just uh, interrupt to say that um, when you reshared your screen, we saw the picture with the wall and the, the, the bricks. Um, we haven't seen anything, any images subsequent to that. And so I just wanted to check whether you were just talking about that single image and uh, or whether there were other things. That one. Right, yeah, we're just seeing that one. Uh, let me let me close. I'm probably messing up the system by not closing them. Excellent. You can see the broken up slabs there. Uh, and anyway, what I'll do now, since I'm running out of time, I'll let you ask me some questions and um, uh, I may introduce uh, photographs if I need to illustrate them. <laughs> Excellent. Well, look, thank you so much for that. That was absolutely fascinating. I'm, um, I'm, I'm sitting here in, in, in my office and uh, my wife was saying, because I've been exclaiming on every picture that you've been bringing up. She'd be saying, oh, I wish I'd joined that. So at least you'll be able to see it on the YouTube video. Uh, but yes, I was absolutely mesmerized by uh, every single uh, slide you brought up there. Uh, so we've had so many questions. We've got about 25 minutes uh, for the, the, the rest of the session. So um, I'm just going to ask a few, a few quick questions uh, from uh, uh, and if, just outline a few comments that have been made on the way way through. Um, Simon, very helpfully, if if uh, others look at the uh, Q and A uh, panel, uh, you'll see that uh, Simon very helpfully brought up uh, uh, a map link. So uh, do use that so that you can uh, home in on uh, where that uh, where where you've been talking about. Um, there was a couple of comments about the uh, gas fitting, and. Um, now, I know some, at least one of the people that uh, raised some doubt is a very keen beer drinker. So he might have been slightly skewed uh, in his love of beer, uh, not mentioning any na uh, names. Yep. Um, uh, but they were saying it looks, could look maybe a little bit like a beer tap. Uh, now you say it, or who, whoever says it, that actually does... does um not that I've ever seen one, but yes, it would fit into the bung of a barrel. Yes, that might, uh, might be it. And that then brings me to a question is, um, we're, we're looking back in time. And so how do we uh, make uh, 
or is it possible to make absolute judgments about some of the things that you find? Who Who is the arbiter on saying, we have found this, it is this date and so on? Because there must be some uh, things that you find are very difficult to place in time. Yeah, it, it is a problem, especially in a site like this, which um, the material covers quite a large date range, as you saw right from yesterday back uh, in the 1970s, it was used as a picnic site. So some of the, we, uh, one of the things that I was able to teach the volunteers was that it's worth looking at crisp packets because they have mm. best by dates on. And we did get a best by date on one of, uh, from 1982, which is quite a long time ago now. Mm. Um, and right way back until, right to, to the time where the, the, uh, the canal was built at the end of the 18th century. So yes, it, it the, we're probably not ever going to be able to say that the spread of rubbish occurred within a narrow time scale because we're getting pottery from the early 19th right the way through to late, the mid 20th say. Um, mm -hmm. the, the reason for it being there is a mystery, which again, mm -hmm. unless we get documentary evidence, remember we're miles from everywhere, so this stuff has to be brought in from somewhere. I didn't, don't think it was the lock keepers who were trundling that afar from their back door, right the way over the canal, or around the corner of the canal, around the pound to dump their rubbish. I think they would have just thrown it in a pit next door. So something, so there was a, something was bringing it there. The uh, people working on the canal, the boat people, didn't live on the boats on the Monmouth and Brecon Canal. So it wasn't their rubbish. And so it's right. not stuff that's being dredged from the bottom of the canal. Yeah, the, right. That's interesting because there was a question about, is this just a case of uh, folks just decluttering and getting rid of some of their old crockery from the boats? You're suggesting that's probably not the case. No, not, not for boats. Um, right. it, it, uh, the nearest pub is at least a kilometre away, unfortunately. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. And so there wasn't a gathering, a reason for gathering place we did find uh, things which perhaps told us a little bit about what was going on that we found several bits of bicycle, okay. bicycle bell uh, and the lock keeper here of course had a whole flight of locks to look after so mm. maybe the lock keeper's bicycle that he rode up and down the towpath to organize the locks these are little stories that you know um, that we can perhaps suggest come from this sort of stuff but the cottage for example we know that it was demolished in the late 50s um, but we don't know when it was built and we don't know whether the uh, ordinate we, we have it on the ordinate survey maps only going back as far as the 1890s um, it, 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 it may have only existed for 60 years but um, uh, so yes it's going to be impossible to be hugely in, uh, um, definitive unless I can find a deed something like that. Right. Yeah. So we've had a lot of questions in relation to the transfer printed uh, pottery and so I, I, I love this sort of stuff um, and so I've got a couple of questions but I'm just going to address some of the questions that have, that have come through. Um, what has happened to those uh, transfer printed shards that you've discovered? Um, are they still on site? Uh, do you rebury them? Do you put them in a display cabinet? What's typically... They, they're at the moment in my cellar. Uh, in, in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, there were about 10 boxes full of material. Um, and that's these big, you know, the, the plastic folding mm -hmm. stackable boxes, 10 of them. Wow. wow. Stuff. Uh, it's incredible. Things other than pottery. It, I, I hope, I hope that it will be, it will be taken, well, I shall certainly take it back to Qumran and to the heritage people in uh, Tofine Council. What happens then is up to them, um, whether they put it on display, whether it whether it's put on display in some way. There is a, a dream, the local trust have a dream that there will be a visitor center. I mean, it's this is ideal stuff for a visitor center. Mm. I have a horrible feeling that in the interim, it will sit in a storeroom somewhere. Um, yeah, so um, just, Building, building on that, uh, first of all, just uh, sticking to the fact that you find so much material on site. How do you, uh, where do you draw the line in terms of detail in archaeology? Because you could have put a 10 centimetre 
grid across that site and registered every piece of pottery in terms of where it showed up, every piece of identifiable metal. Um, you could have, I guess, written on every piece. Um, where's the boundary between we're just, this is interesting and we need to get down into the detail? I think if it was a site that had um, stratification, then we would have done exactly what you're talking about. Mm. Uh, stratification for those people who, 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 it's jargon, of course, but it means that archaeology, of course, is all about layers of, of horizons. And, and we go, as we dig, we go back in time as we take out horizon after horizon. So we take, we strip off the turf, that's the top horizon. We go down through the next deposit and through the next deposit. Well, the, it, on a, on a, site which is say an urban site you might have a stratification going back from today right the way back to neolithic times and each each um, deposit will have its own strata if you like so there's um, a question that kind of talks to that in that um has it ever been a case where a canal has been driven through a uh, medieval or even earlier uh, village and therefore you start to find uh, things that are relevant or relate to way before the canal period? I can't honestly answer that because um, I, I know when, when railways were constructed, they often recorded um, going through, um, especially Roman things. They, they were obsessed with Romans. Um, the, the navvies who were digging canals, um, I, I'm not sure whether they were quite as keen on, you know, if they found something, they probably just dug it up. I honestly don't know. Um, and it would be a fascinating thing to find out if any other archaeological project or any other canal restoration project. Uh, and I have had um, uh, rumours that occasionally, you know, bits of pottery have been found, but um, most of it. For example, I mean, the, the, the puzzle is, um, I show those photographs of Stover. I, I, I led a, a, a canal camp down there five years ago, was it? Um, and we were finding stuff very similar to what we were finding at uh, Tikoch uh, in Stover, uh, beside the Stover Canal. Uh, a year or two before that, I helped on a canal camp which um, did some work on the Swansea Canal. And lo and behold, we found material there, which was very similar to what, what we were finding. So there seems to be a relationship between canals and canal sides uh, and uh, collections of 19th century rubbish. Um, and I can't answer what that connection is yet. And that's one of the frustrating things. By the way, going back to your previous question, although the material will be perhaps in, in storage, I, sh I shall have published um, photographs of it all. The photographs that you see, you saw on there, there will be photographs of every, every, every piece of pottery. Um, and so uh, hopefully someone as enthusiastic as me about transfer printed pottery will be able to come along and go through those photographs in large bits because they'll be high definition. And so, oh yeah, I, I've got a piece of that. Um, and, and that's already happened. I can identify some of those wares and when they were made and whatever. So that, um, that brings me to a question I wanted to ask because I've just recently taken on an allotment and it was in pretty poor state. And so I've been digging it over and digging it quite deeply. And I've uncovered all sorts of stuff. And I've come across obviously a lot of uh, broken shards of, uh, of, of pottery. Now I wonder, those of us that are app driven uh, we know that we can turn our shazam app on and we it can listen to a piece of music and it can instantly tell us what that piece of music is yep. does anything like that exist where i can take a photograph of a piece of pottery and it says we've got this on record and uh, this is a fine piece of wedgewood or this has come from the ming dynasty or anything like that does any of those sort of tools do any of those tools exist it's funny you should say that because I was asking, well, I wasn't really asking the question. I was exclaiming my frustration that there isn't such a thing that, you know, we, as you say, we dig up this stuff all the time. And with the wonders of 
technology and big data and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes, there should be, you know, we can now have apps which identify plants for us and yeah. why not something that can, um, and perhaps someone out there <laughs> listening at the, at the 84 people there, um, you know, has the skill to create something like that. Because it would be a huge, because this stuff, again, the, 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 the transfer of printed pottery is found around the world. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, one of the one of the stories I would tell is that one of the hotspots for blue and white um, transfer printed material is Venezuela, made in okay. Staffordshire and exported to Venezuela. Um, and uh, you know, they f find tons of it. Well, ton, I don't know, but lots of it uh, on sites there. Very interesting. So, um, a couple of questions in relation to the property then. And um, there was a comment that was made that uh, the position of the chimney stacks, the fact that there were, I think, two, two uh, chimney stacks on the, the house, there didn't, didn't, didn't seem to be anything apparent on the, I think it was the west side. Yes, Obviously, the main fireplace me, was on the east side. That caused me a bit of grief at first, <laughs> as I stood there and looked at this wall, which didn't have any sign of a fireplace. Then I realised that it, began, it, was up, it, was the, it was the bedroom. Because they're quite small chimneys, there wasn't room for a multiple flue. You know, in, in the house I live in at the moment has double flues so that the bedroom chim, chim, uh, fireplace is Im immediately above the fireplace on the floor below. There wasn't that room in, so uh, it would have uh, started if the fireplace would have started, the fireplace would have been in the bedroom. Yes, uh, that makes sense. So to, to return to your allotment. Oh yes. Picking up. And this is a, a something for everybody, really. Uh, I had an allotment for six years. Unfortunately, when I moved to Leeds, I couldn't bring it with me. Um, but I, at the same time, I was doing an MA in historical archaeology for the fun of it. And my uh, one of the projects I did in that was to analyse the 635 fragments of pottery I found from my in my allotment. And the first question I had to answer about that is why why was it there? Because again, this was a site which, before it became allotments in the 1920s, was open fields. And the solution to this, and perhaps the solution to the issue by the canals, is that uh, it, all that material probably came from night soil. If, uh, before the days of, of uh, running uh, of WCs, water closets, and sewers, and all that thing, you would have had in your back garden a privy and the privy was often dry, it was a bucket, and you performed, uh, and then you covered up the performance with anything handy, and it was usually ashes, or rubbish, or sand, or soot, or anything, um, sweepings from the floor. At night time, someone, a cart would roll by down, uh, by, down your back alley, and a night soil man, or men, would collect the contents of the bucket in a in a in their wagon they would then take it to the open fields and tip it out on the fields as fertilizer mm -hmm. and they were called night soil men because they operated at night uh, and so my explanation for my allotment is probably perhaps yours too is the material was coming from fertilizer from night soil very interesting now we've got less than 10 minutes left and i'm yeah. conscious that there's still quite a few questions there so we'll try and rattle through them because uh yeah, some great uh, variation on the and a great variety of, of questions. Um, so just and a couple of comments as well. Uh, comments saying that if someone died at the cottage, all their stuff uh, would likely have been thrown away just en masse. And so maybe that um, could give reasons for some of the, the things. It, it, it was a custom, uh, but I'm not sure whether it happened in Wales, um, certainly in Ireland. Mm. Uh, if someone died, they would literally smash up all their, their blue and white pottery. Yeah. Um, slightly pa paganish, you know, to stop the spirit yeah. coming back and using the, the thing. It may very well be that. Um, but having said that, we, uh, the only time I've come across it, something similar happening, was the, the material was all dumped in one spot. Whereas yeah. our material is spread over a, a large, probably... Uh, 200 meters by 200 meters approximately. Very interesting. Um, and so, very, good idea, very good suggestion. Yes, another interesting question or uh, comment regarding the occupants of the cottage. Could census information, or have you looked into census information for the cottage? No, no, I haven't done, I haven't had 
because of all this stuff, because I'm a volunteer like everybody else, <laughs> I, have a, I have a life, <laughs> even in lockdown. Um, and uh, yes, I haven't yet done the, the, pa the, the paper his historical research and going through. Um, we know that the last lock keeper was called Dick the Lock. Um, and, <laughs> and, and people remember he died in the very early 50s, I think. Um, is, people remember his daughters um, as, as sort of elderly ladies living in the cottage. Uh, because as, as children, they used to cycle on towpath and, and probably be cheeky to them. But, um, there's very, but I haven't done the historical paperwork yet. Excellent. And I, I know what it's like. There's, there's only so many hours in the day for these things to happen. But I think what you've done today is really inspire people to get involved. And I know that there are many of the attendees that, have, uh, that are on the webinar today that have been on your camps. Uh, and it's certainly something that I'd like to do once we get back into normal times again, because I'm certainly fascinated uh, by this. And um, just in the final five minutes or so, um, are you able to tell us any more about the little China doll? Yes. Um, what I, this is this is the the one I showed you the picture of. This is the one oh, that okay. was painted uh, last year. Mm. Um, and as you can see, the little now. Um, this is what it it would have originally looked like. So this is right. a complete version of the same thing. Now they were they were all. Um, uh, all. It's a very, very bad thing to say all in archaeology. <laughs> the majority of them were naked babies. Okay. Uh, and they had some variations. Some of them had painted hair, some of them had painted eyes. Some of them, very few, had clothing. Um, some were, uh, the minority were male, another minority were black. Um, and they occur uh, on, and the archaeologists being lazy, uh, whenever they've dug these up, have said, oh, look, it's evidence of children. There must have been children here. Um, I'm not of that uh, opinion because, A, they're extremely boring toys. You can't do anything with them. You can't dress them very well. Um, and uh, so there, there's a huge range of other suggestions for them. Uh, baked in cakes, baked in puddings, um, the good luck things, fertility, uh, charms. Um, they were there's some peculiar things about them for example one was found hidden in a wall in new zealand another was found in a bag containing live ammunition on a civil war american civil war battlefield 1865 battle of champion hill um, one was found wrapped in a sock in a um, uh, carpenter's chest in a wreck on the missouri river about 1860 something um, and two at least were found in a brothel in um, Idaho in and uh, so and a, a, a last one I was actually talking about this last night was found in Alderley Edge in a miners a miners cottage in Alderley Edge. They are a mystery. They're they're everywhere. I, I have a feeling they're charms. They were used as charms. They they were last made I think before the first just before the First World War, um, but had existed for about hundred years before that. Rafe, you're very passionate about this. One of the things you didn't say when uh, in the introductions, how on earth did you get into this in the first place? In, into into, in, into archaeology, in archaeology, in well. archaeology in general and then taking it into the canal? Um, well, I'll, I'll go backwards because I know we've got five minutes left. I just want to say one of the things doesn't come across in, in, in all these slides of, of, of rocks and bricks and things like that is the fun of this and the fun of running and being part of an, a canal camp and uh, and this, this these particular canal camps were absolutely exhausting because um i know i had to i was the only basically the only archaeologist so i had to train all these people watch them all the time answer all the questions because unlike where you say to someone go and repoint that wall you, you give them that job at, at the beginning of the day and they're still doing it as you when you pack up uh, the archaeology people are saying what's this you know and I have to watch them. It was exhausting, but it was hugely enjoyable. And it, it's one of the sort of things about leadership in this sort of environment, this voluntary environment. All the people wanted to be there. They weren't there forced to be there. They were excited by what we were finding. and, and things. So um, the, the, the process, and that's probably been true the whole of my archaeological career, going back thousands of years. I started as a schoolboy um, when uh, my father, 
uh, sent me a, a, during a summer holidays because I was sitting at home saying I'm bored, as like you know, teenagers do. And he said, okay, go and, go and work on this, volunteer on this archaeological site. And I still remember, and in fact, I got a prop now, hang on a second. I still remember the day when I found uh, my very first piece of pottery. It, was a, it wasn't as dramatic as this even, it was just a, a body shirt. This is 13th century shell gritted medieval pottery, uh, which I found amongst my father's belongings uh, after he died. Uh, and he apparently had rescued it from the spoil heap on that very site when he came to visit it. Uh, and I still remember the feeling that I had when I found that piece of very unglamorous pottery and my hands started trembling and, and I was hooked. It's a drug. It's a drug. And then I spent 20 years in the field doing the same thing over and over again. <laughs> well, it's great that you've been able to bring that passion to the, the waterways. Um, there are quite a few other questions that we really haven't had a, a chance uh, to, to answer, but I... I must admit, the first time I really knew that canal camps uh, covered archaeology was when I uh, came to uh, South Wales and picked up a van at the end of your camp to take to Inglesham uh, a couple of years ago and uh, suddenly realised what had been going on uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the cottage uh, in that previous week. And I certainly hope that when we get back to better times when we can uh, do all this again and uh, get out there in the field, uh, that I'll get onto one of uh, one of these camps. I think you have inspired uh, a lot of people here today, and certainly, if there's one camp that's going to be oversubscribed in future, it's definitely yours. So I wish you well. There's been some comments around how that we perhaps haven't publicised this quite as much as we should, and I I would echo that. Perhaps we should need to to give it a little bit more thought. Uh, and also, uh, one of my thoughts as you were speaking is that we do. Uh, we do leadership training on a whole host of different areas and we do skills training on many areas, digger driving and bricklaying and things like that. And perhaps we should be looking at having uh, uh, authorization tickets for archaeology at some stage in future. So uh, not promising anything on that one, but I'm sure you'd get behind that. And I'd very, like, uh, very much like to support that type of thing going forward. So um, Rafe, we've got uh, 30 seconds left. I'll uh, just hand it over to you for those 30 seconds just to for any final thoughts well, it's been a great pleasure i've enjoyed it as usual i can talk about this forever um my best wishes to all those people who are out there who may have uh, worked with me before and thank you and um, i hope to see you soon